All right, well, those are some tough acts to follow. Um, <laughs> we're a little bit behind in Cowden Syndrome, my area that I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about. But um, what we're doing in gastroenterology, I think is something that all researchers can do and hopefully can pick up a couple of tips from what we've been doing. So just uh, can't give a talk about what I'm doing without telling you a little bit about Cowden Syndrome. So this is a graph looking at all colon cancers and you can see that the, the hereditary colon cancers are the rare here, less than 4%, and the one I focus on is in this less than 0.1% group. So certainly rare. Um, what I like about it is it's fairly new, so it was first described in 1963, and this is a homegrown Ohio disease, so first described in Youngstown, Ohio, which is actually where I grew up. So I didn't find this out until after I had published a couple papers on it, but I thought it was kind of uh, good karma for me. So P10 is a tumor suppressor gene. It was actually a little red circle on that subway map that Dr. Griever showed us. Um, and when you, you have germline or inherited mutations in it, people get a lot of cancer. It is autosomal dominant, so a 50-50 risk for children and, and relatives. Um, the prevalence is about one in 250,000. So if you look at that in Columbus, that's gonna be three or four people in Columbus. I think that's a little bit of an underestimate because I definitely have more than three or four patients with it, but it is rare. Um, and it certainly affects families. So similar to kind of Nancy and Margie's talk, when a family has Cowden syndrome, um, they're very affected and it really disrupts their regular life. So the increased risk for colon cancer has just been described in the last five years, but it's about a 10 times risk. But you can see breast cancer is 25 times risk, thyroid cancer is 50 times risk. So these families have a lot of cancer. Um, the clinical management is still not optimized, so it's so rare that they're, the national can, uh, the NCCN, so National Comprehensive Cancer Network, has some recommendations, but they're based on expert opinion. Um, what I want to do in my focus is on how do we improve the clinical care of these patients and specifically for their colon polyps. Um, so the first step that we took, you know, similar to everyone, is when I was a resident, um, I looked at the Mayo Clinic experience, which is kind of in the middle of this graph, and when I was a fellow, I said what OSU had been doing and did a systematic review looking at everyone. Um, but once you do that, kind of what's the next step? Um, and really, our next step and what we're doing in GI um, on my hand was inspired by a patient, Ken, um, gave me the okay to talk about him a little bit. Um, but he was on an NIH trial looking at a medication for Cowden syndrome. Unfortunately, kind of like Dr. Griever was mentioning, this has never been published, which is a source of frustration for both of us. Um, but he had great success on this trial, and actually his daughter did well. Um, and for the three years in between the trial, when he saw me as primary care doctor, it was you know, prescribing this medication, but with really no follow-up. Um, no one else in the country that I'm aware of is using this on a regular basis besides Ken and his family. But he saw that I was interested in Cowden syndrome. You know, I think he just Googled me, but actually kind of my first month as an attending, he emailed me and I said, okay, I think we could do this. Um, we put together a clinical protocol and we've been doing that. But the really important thing besides, you know, continuing Ken's treatment is that he's such a strong patient advocate that he really um, got us moving and how do we affect more patients? How do we improve the lives of other people with Cowden syndrome? And kind of goes along with what um, the other patient advocate you know, responses have been. We don't have anything as strong as the myeloma group or the um, lysosomal storage group. I'm really jealous about what they've just talked about. Um, but what we've done is kind of something I think everyone can do. Um, just a brief detour here. So why is seroma so exciting? Um, you can see on the, on the mice here on the right, rapamycin is another name for it. But, um, the column on the right are mice who got rapamycin from birth. The column on the left are mice who didn't. And you can see the facial papules and the palmar papules and how different the mice look with it. And then what's really exciting is that you can give a mouse who has all of the papules rapamycin and the changes reverse. So um, like I talked about, Ken was in this trial. It closed you know, three years ago, four years ago, and nothing's been published. Um, but what I'd like to do is kind of set us up to do, you know, for me and my colleagues to do the next step in this, and Ken wants to do that as well. Um, now, how are we gonna do that? Well, our first step is to focus on patients and educating patients, so similar to what you've heard. Um, what we've been doing in GI is putting together patient-oriented symposiums. Um, so I did my first one about a year ago um, for Cowden syndrome and P10-related disorders. So we had about 15 people come, um, and then you know, 15 to 20 people watching online, but that was an international audience um, and really, we spread this just through word of mouth. So Ken has done a great job um, on the blogs, on the Facebook posts. He's involved in all that. And just kind of letting people know once we put this together and decided on a time, 
he spread the word for me. Um, and then we let all the other OSU docs know. Um, but similar to what you've heard, these patients with rare diseases are interested in this. Um, they want to they wanna learn more, and they know how to get together with other patients with the same disease um, and really spread the word with kind of minimal work um, for us. So this is a picture from our first talk, or our first session. So you can see me in the middle, and then um, Rob Polarski is one of our genetic counselors who's an expert in Cowden syndrome, and Doreen Agnes from Serge Anc here. Dr. Erdman, who's a pediatric, a polyposis specialist at Nationwide, and Dr. Sipos in endocrine who takes care of our Cowden syndrome patients with thyroid nodules. Um, what I don't have, the person not in this picture is Ken, um, but similar to what you've heard. So he gave a kind of a talk about his experience and you know he's had a good result with a mist, but not even just with that, but his experience as a patient engaging in research and being a patient advocate. Um, and that was a really strong and moving moment. And so I think you know when you put these together, patients do want to hear about the disease and hear about what you're going to do but also having that patient get up and talk and you know, talking about what their experience has been is really, really a good option. Um, next week, we're or actually this Saturday, we're having our second um, symposium. Again, a good response you know, for a rare disease, having 15 people show up in person um, and many more you know, internationally even um, is exciting. Um, I didn't mention, but I think this is only, I know this is the only counting conference in the country, and I'm pretty sure the only counting conference in the world. So um, it's early, you know, we're building our name and reputation, but I, you know, we've had a really good response. One thing we've done with this is that we did put together basically a video library of these talks. So we have this available um, for our patients. So for newly diagnosed patients, for people to spread on the, on the internet, um, for our patients to know about whenever we get an email from a patient or from a provider, um, we always send them this link. So um, unfortunately our views are a little bit low because actually someone bootlegged our videos off the internet before I could get these up. Um, but hopefully this year um, we'll have a true idea of how many people are watching these. Um, so with that, with these educational materials, I think we're making a difference. I think we're getting you know, more patients and more people um, to know that OSU is focused on that and bringing them in. Um, I'm interested to kind of hear what everyone else has to say. I myself haven't really been in the social media and blogs. Ken has been helping me with that and our other patients have been spreading the word. Um, not sure, you know, maybe um, for the other patient advocacy groups, I'm not sure how to work as a provider trying to tap into those patients, how to kind of enter that um, fray. So I haven't done that yet, but I think clearly that's the way things are going is that we're gonna need to have a presence on the internet. Um, I am working with patient advocacy groups, so there's not a real strong one for Cowden syndrome. Hopefully that'll come, um, but I am gonna be part of this hereditary colon cancer um, lecture series, and I think that's gonna be well received as well. And you know, so that's how we're trying to kind of get the word out. Um, just want to point out, as I was kind of putting together this talk, um, one, of, one of the BMT doc, bone marrow transplant doctors here at OSU um, had a really nice newspaper article written about them and their experience, so I think you know, kind of engaging with media in any way possible is beneficial. Um, so the next step that I'm taking is, so we get all these emails and like Dr. Griever mentioned, um, once you become an expert or say you're an expert in a certain area, you're gonna get emails from providers and patients. So Rob and I put together a clinic uh, where these patients could come and see us. For now it's once a month, um, but we have a, patient, a place for these patients to call home and come and see us um, with really a goal of regional and national referrals. Um, and then as we build that clinical experience, then you know, that's something we could look at and hopefully optimize. Um, within that, what something that I, the patients have really responded to is kind of a preferred referral network within OSU. So one of the common complaints we get, and I think probably Nancy and Margie would echo this, is you know, I know more about this disease than the doctors you're sending me to. They've never heard of Cowden syndrome. Um, so what, what I have is I've kind of isolated one or two people in each specialty area that we use who are kind of my go-to people. I've talked to them a little bit. I've talked to them about Cowden syndrome. You know, they've been to the lectures. I've given them kind of the core literature. And then more importantly, they're seeing more and more people with this. And the patients have really responded to that um, well. So I think that's an important thing that we could look at and say, okay, you know, if there's only one or two people in Columbus with your disease, let's make sure that they're seeing the same person so they can have someone who has heard of it before who knows what to do. Um, just want to give thanks to Dr. Conwell, who's my division director in GI, who's really kind of led this way for me and really supported this, um, and Dr. Le uh, Levine, who kind of brought me here and who's our assistant division director and has been very supportive as well. Um, 
So that's kind of our experience, not as impressive as the other talks you've heard, but I think it's something that everyone can do in your area and be well received. I think that was a great outline for, for some of the things that Dr. Sandich is doing, and so I encourage you to, we will be recording all of these and posting them online. You can watch these presentations again later, which will include the slides as well. If you want to sort of follow along with his steps and maybe add your own, I'm sure that he would welcome a conversation as to how, uh, how you can uh, share ideas. Uh, also, uh, I just wanted to have Amanda uh, Kennedy, who is our community engagement program manager, wave her hand in the back. She is a great resource to reach out if you need to try and find um, support for finding members uh, in the community and, and starting to build a cohort or, or, or a group to help you. Uh, and we, you know, the NI, NIH and NCATS is really pushing for getting um, members of your study population or people who are living with the disease and experiencing it to be part of that study design process as much as possible so that we can make sure that we're not only trying to find solutions but that they are ones that align with the interests of the people that actually live with it. So um, I'll let Sharon take over here and uh, you'll, be, you'll get a chance during the speed networking hopefully to, to speak with these, uh, some of these people that are um, presenting. So that'll be a good opportunity there as well to talk to them.